Hey everyone, welcome back to the Black Standard Podcast. My name is Courtney Ann Wallace and we are at episode 16 of the Black Standard Podcast. We're actually almost at the end of season one. I think we have about one or two episodes left. We're going to get straight into the podcast today because we have a really, really cool guest that I really want to talk about. So as you guys know, the mantra, it's normal here on the podcast every episode. So it goes like this. I am happy to be alive. My heart is clean. My mind is open. I am ready to receive. You guys put that on a sticky note, put it on your mirror, put it as your lock screen. You guys know 2021 has been a rough year and we need to be open to new opportunities. So today's guest, right? Her name is Anissa Ford. She is 23 years old and she's from St. Catherine like me. (laughs) And she attended the University of the West Indies where she actually pursued a Bachelor of Laws. Um, She attended the Cave Hill Campus Barbados, which is not here in Jamaica. That's another island. A lot of you guys think that Jamaica is the only island in the Caribbean. She is now a licensed real estate agent, guys. That's right. She is a girl boss. She is doing the doing things, okay? Her two primary philosophies are one, yin and yang, the Chinese concept of dualism and the Chinese, the Japanese concept of Kaizen. Now, this represents continuous self-development, self-improvement, right? She's passionate about creating the life she's dreamed about, which is being a boss, babe, a happy success successful attorney, a real estate developer, a businesswoman, guys. Like I said, she's doing the doing things, okay? Now, she enjoys community service. She loves giving back. She loves real estate. She loves decor and a ton of other interesting things that we will be discussing during this episode. So, welcome to the podcast, Anissa. (laughs) Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Girl, you have a lot of stuff in your portfolio. (laughs) Dang. It's been a while, 22 years, but I'm here for the ride. (laughs) You're doing the doing things. (laughs) Okay, so let's get straight into, you know, life as young Anissa. What was that like for you? Were you always living in St. Catherine? What high school did you go to? Um, Yeah, I've lived in St. Catherine for all of my life. Um, I would spend spend summers, Christmas, any kind of holiday, really, with Mm -hmm. my grandparents in St. Thomas. But for the most part, I've been in St. Catherine. I went to the St. Andrew High School for Girls, period. This is a Wilmerian podcast. (laughs) I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, Yeah, and life for me was, I mean, regular. I was mostly inside just watching TV. I I have a sibling, so, you know, it was a lot of playing. Like, I have a Oh, I don't have siblings. Girl, I don't know. It's a blessing and a curse, but it's (laughs) a lot of fun. But yeah, um, I'm just grateful for my parents that mm-hmm. kind of, you know, afforded me some level. They, they don't have a Let's just say that, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. At the end of the day, I had a good childhood. I can say that for the most part. Yeah. Right. All right, cool. So um, college, right? I noticed that you didn't attend UE here, but rather in Barbados. So for those of you who are listening, um, the University of the West Indies is like a chain of campuses across the, the West Indies, obviously. And um, we have different campuses in different islands. So what was life like? Did you have to like live in Barbados for a couple of years? How did that work? So I lived in Barbados for a little over three years when the pandemic actually hit. I was stranded or whatever. Really? Yeah. I come back home. But I mean, that aside, it was an amazing experience. I always tell persons, like, if they ask me about university, which university should I go to? The University of the West Indies gave the campus. That has made me the woman I am today. Um, it's a different culture, you know, when you move away from your home, your mm-hmm. thought processes and everything is just broadened and you look at life a little bit differently. And so I have a greater appreciation for life. And, you know, I have a lot of friends from over the Caribbean now. I and was going to ask that. Yeah, my, my best friends, they're from Trinidad. Um, Saint oh, Kitts, so. Antigua. 
Oh, so okay, yeah. So they're yeah. they're international students as well. You know, it's it's kind of crazy because although I wasn't an international student at um, the Caribbean Maritime University, I had a lot of Antiguan friends, and they're really cool. Like guys, you would be surprised how many things we have in common as Caribbean yeah. youth. And I mean, even with the Hispanic Caribbean countries, one of my best friend, Priscilla, we met on the J1 program and I talked to her more than a lot of my local friends and even some of the dishes that we have here. I mean, it has a Spanish name, but it's literally the same thing, same culture. It's crazy. And as you talk about food, I was introduced to some crazy, crazy food that I'm not going to lie. It just makes you it more rival the Jamaican food, didn't it? <laughs> Listen, oh my goodness, they have a thing called black pudding, I believe, which is like intestines mm. filled with blood and rice and some holy for other things. But anyways, the point is that you just have to appreciate other persons. Blood clothes. of what? Huh? Blood of what? What animal? The cow? What? The- you I didn't say blood and I gotta leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what kind of. I don't need, I think it's pork, right? But I could be corrected on that. I believe You know it's- what? I'm not even going to judge because a lot of Jamaicans love tripe and beans. Not me, but a lot of Jamaicans. <laughs> all right, cool, also appreciate cool. The other cultures and respect it. That's all. Honestly, I was telling my partner that one of my long-term dreams, because a lot of people aspire to travel to the United States and a lot of people aspire to travel to Canada, but I don't know. As a J-1 student, I feel like I've had my full portion of the States in terms of traveling. I'd like to see some other islands now. You know, I'd like to go. And 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 these are actually places where you don't need a visa necessarily either, right? Yeah. Once you have your... Well, some islands. Some yeah. islands. Once you have a CARICOM passport, then you're um, allowed to go to any of the CARICOM states. Mm-hmm. And so I think you should take full opportunity. I mean, I would have I wanted agree. to go to more countries, but girl, Corona come at the worst time. I'm not even going to lie. I girl. just went to university and boom, a whole pandemic. I can't go nowhere or anything. Your whole 20s just fly like that. Boom, bye, <laughs> <laughs> gone. I mean, we can organize a little a little girl's trip, you know, a little a little. Um, a little vaccinated girls trip here for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's jump into your real estate life. So you are fresh on the block as a realtor. Tell me what the process was like. You know, what inspired you to actually jump into real estate? I don't know if you know this, but I have a YouTube channel and I post a lot of house tours. So I've been considering myself to get my license because people think I sell houses anyway. <laughs> And I would so, yeah, I, I've really been thinking about it. And with the whole pandemic, um, you know, sometimes you might have to shift around some business moves. And I think real estate is one of those industries that I would say are pandemic proof because land land is scarce, literally. You know what I mean? <laughs> Prices have gone up in a right. pandemic. You don't even tell me, girl. I was doing a house. To, I did a $90 million house the other day. In this island, 19, it was in USD. It was in USD. The fact that the houses are now in US dollars. Yeah. And I've actually had a client that has said to me, I don't understand. He's he's from overseas, but he's asking, why why am I paying USD to purchase land in Jamaica? He couldn't understand it. And I was like, listen, the persons are going to capitalize on the dollar. And the dollar is so strong compared to ours so so is that what prompted you to to jump in or were you always passionate about the real estate market mm, okay so from what a little girl it's two things people well yeah two things people know about me my parents used to work at well my mom still works at courts right so mm-hmm. i used to be in the store like from morning till night because she would work late i would steal their magazines and like <laughs> the furniture <laughs> and put them in little shoe boxes and make like houses just design houses and stuff oh like. that's so cute i just hide them under my bed <laughs> i would also cut them out and make like scrapbook designs so from morning there mm-hmm. was passion for i wouldn't say real estate but just property in general i wasn't sure what i wanted to do i just know it had to do with real estate did you watch hgtv right this a girl, like- girl. <laughs> 
Listen, <laughs> my parents, listen, the only reason we still have flow as you point think, was because of HGTV. You'd think that as children, we'd be interested in Disney. I knew mm. I always was, you know, I knew I was going to be a business person because okay. I, I loved HGTV a little bit too much. Absolutely. That was, it, listen, if I go over people's hopes, guess what channel we're going on? HGTV and you just have to live with it. Sorry. Period. 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 Yeah, so the reason that I got into real estate was because even up until my final year, I know that I wasn't going to apply to law school straight away. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what avenue to take to get into real estate. I initially planned to be a realtor in Barbados, right? Then the pandemic hit and I was like, okay, I have to come home. That's when I found out about the um, Real Estate Training Institute. Basically, yeah. what they do is they train you and it's um, mandatory for you to be certified before you can practice um, any real estate business. So I was like, okay, actually just was driving on the road and I passed a sign and I was like, oh, well, yeah, that's what we're doing. And, and that was just it after that, like, cause I wasn't sure what to do next. I considered being a flight attendant. So. And you know, that's totally fine. I, f- I find that a, y- a lot of young people, like after the three or four years, depending on the length of your degree, of course, there's always like a rift as to, what do I do with myself now? And unfortunately, a lot of persons delay this in the form of a master's. I'm not bashing anyone with a master's, but I find that a lot of persons are doing master's not because they want to, but because they're kind of delaying that time to like get out there and make decisions about what they're doing with their life. And so they want to study a little bit longer, if you know what I mean. Is that you? before i found out about like how to get my foot in the door in real estate honestly you want my honest opinion sure. if it is that i i mean if it is for your self-gratification go for it yeah. but other than that if you if you're going to be like a businesswoman or an entrepreneur i really don't think it's that like in terms of qualifications overall it's it's overhyped if you ask me, um, a lot of persons that I know that are super, super smart, they didn't learn these things in school. I have no you know, issues with the education system, but I just feel like if you're going to be pursuing all of those stuff, it's probably because you want your resume to look good. But if I am my own boss, in a sense, I don't really need my resume. And so that's, that's why I'm saying if it is that you want, if you have a personal want to learn more yeah. or you're passionate, go for it. But if if that other than that, if if you're not planning to work for someone, save your money. I don't know. <laughs> I, I agree with you because the proof is in the pudding. Many of the most successful persons out there. Yeah. What's, what's, what's cool? <laughs> like you understand they did what they had to do to get out and then they went out on their own and they made smart decisions and, and it's 2021 we have you t- you have persons posting two hour courses on topics on youtube like yeah. you want to know how i passed cxc math and got a distinction damien crawford's youtube channel i yeah. kid you not yes girl he, yeah. he didn't know he did math no <laughs> no yes he's a i mean he's a lecturer at ue but he had a channel with math that's how i learned pythagoras theorem youtube oh, wow. <laughs> that you sweat and tears <laughs> girl in math class your girl left your girl moved from 50 percent to a distinction honey <laughs> anyway so the big question i want to ask you have you sold your first listing yet yes no it's in a pipeline <laughs> so is um, it a partnership with another realtor what's going on yeah so we it's a, a, we're a part of the same firm okay. um but we're supposed to be closing pretty soon and i'm just you know all fingers crossed on that i've put in the work and i'm just you know waiting to see it come through i feel like i i, I feel like we need to have a conversation after this podcast because i'm really really interested in getting my license next year believe me <laughs> you asked me about the process I'm going to be straight with you it's not that hard you understand I mean the course I load otherwise no okay when I say it's not that hard I mean the process but the course load itself it's a lot to remember 
and you might have um some nights where you're like listen you see this right here it's not the course that i've heard about it's the exams i've heard that you know they can be a little bit biased as to who passes and who doesn't pass that's what i've heard and i've also heard that too and i don't know of that being the truth i, mm -hmm. I don't because the persons that i have known have done the course and they passed i they think passed, that, right. yeah, as far as i'm concerned once you put in the work and you're sure you put in the work the exam is multiple choice so i don't know if from your ex all multiple choice are you hearing me <laughs> it's two exams um you have poker which is a proceeds of crime act and aml anti-money laundering and then you mm -hmm. have the main paper which is a whole bunch of stuff girl um land registration <sighs> contract law business law yeah it's a lot um map okay. but and that is a hundred questions right so it's a lot of content but it's not difficult to understand it's just a lot mm -hmm. to memorize i think okay. you should, i think you have That's some, fine. You I, should, I do i know <laughs> hello <laughs> it's me <laughs> okay okay so another question what are the different types of realtors i know but i'd like you to speak so our listeners can kind of understand um the different types of realtors out there all right so typically you have a seller's agent which is the agent that is responsible for getting your house basically they're the, uh, selling your house apologies right so you have a house you want it to be sold i'm a seller's agent i'm going to offer my services to market it to the best of my ability so that your house can be sold right then you have a buyer's agent. A buyer's agent is someone who is going to be helping you to find your next home, right? You have agents that deal with rentals as well. So if you're just looking for yeah. something- Yeah, how does that work? Right, so you're looking for something short-term, typically a year, which can be um, extended, then you would go to an agent that specifically deals with rentals. Now, are you asking about the commission? Is that mainly what you're asking? We can get into that later. Okay. We can get right. into the numbers later. <laughs> right. So it's a matter of basically doing your searches and finding a property that fits the wants and needs of the um, potential tenant and then making contact with either the listing agent or the landlord specifically and getting them to, you know, allow the person to come in, show them the place. And from there, you just go on to paperwork, really. So basically, guys, if it is that you're selling the house, um, that realtor will be trying to find a buyer for you. So that's what you meant by the seller's agent, right? If you're looking for a house, they that agent will be looking for houses on sale. I, I was quite iffy about the whole rental thing because I don't really know how it works in terms of the commission, but I guess we can talk about that later on when we're discussing numbers. Okay. So um, my, next, my next question is, um, you know, the other day I had a, a viewer comment on my YouTube channel. He's... He's not Jamaican. And he was asking about, you know, the truth behind realtors having to be lawyers. Yeah. So he was saying if there's any truth to that. So I figured I'd ask you since you're coming on the podcast. Um, so no, there's no legal or any other type of requirement that a realtor has to be an attorney. The um, requirements for you to be certified are that you are over the age of 18 um and you pass the course and a bunch of other stuff that have nothing to do with you being an attorney <laughs> you don't need to have a degree no you could oh go really straight. no you, you hear straight. that guys no yeah. degree required <laughs> so, the barrier to entry is i don't want to say it's low because you have to be able That'd to be really pay. hard yeah um, pay the fees it's Last I checked, 70,000 Jamaican per dollars. Per year, isn't it? It's per year, right? So it's not new. So it's just for the course itself. You understand? I was told the 70 was every year to renew or to maintain the license. No. So what I was speaking about was the cost of doing the course. Of course. Right? Okay. The thing is $22,000 oh. per year. Yeah. I was misinformed then. <laughs> I was told it's 70 every year. Because I was like, what? Okay, I know what they're talking about. 
<laughs> the RAJ fees, which is the Realtors Association of Jamaica. Those fees now, that's where it starts to pile up. So, so the 22 is not the only thing you have to pay every year. $22,000 is for the um, for your license to be renewed at the um, REB, which is the um, Real Estate Board of Jamaica, right? Yes. The RAJ now, they are the Real Estate Association of Jamaica and they're responsible for um, basically giving access to the multiple listing service and um, it's just an organization that realtors based on their broker relationship with RAJ are required to subscribe to. What's a multiple listing service? What is that? Is that like a database with all the houses that are on sale? So I thought, here's what I always thought. I thought if someone is selling and they need assistance to sell, then they would contact a realtor and say, hey, can you be my agent? And then that listing would be under, um, I don't know, what's your broker's name? Gorzon Realty Group. Right. So it would be a, a Gorzon listing or a millennium listing or a 21 century listing. I didn't know it was like a general database. Okay. So it is specific. The listing itself is specific to the brokerage. However, what okay. the multiple listing service enables the, basically the owner of the property is for greater exposure. So what the multiple listing service does is when you upload it to that system, it allows all realtors all over the island to see that listing. And if they have a buyer or a tenant, tenant respectively, they can actually come in and see the listing. And oh, say, oh, oh, yeah. So it's really for um, buyers agents to see or to, to find houses for their clients. No, it can. And also for sellers agents to kind of advertise to buyers agents. And landlords as well. And landlords, right. right. Any type of property, land, house, commercial, it, mm. any property you want to upload, you upload it to the system and it allows, and you can actually send the listing to your client directly. So so another question, if, if the multiple listing service, hopefully I got the name right, if that's there, what's yeah. the purpose of a broker? Okay, so a broker by law is required a lot, there are a lot of opinions on this, right? But plainly put, by law, an, an agent has to operate on that broker, right? Because it's a regulatory mechanism in order. Back in the days, they used to have agents that are very unscrupulous. And so the broker is kind of the an entity that represents the transaction. Right. So that's absolutely correct. So that broker is. He's actually the one, and I say he, I just mean he or she. He's actually yeah. the one that is doing the transaction. You are the one facilitating it, so you would be the sub-agent, but the broker is the agent. Do you understand? So it's 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 kind of like <clears throat> it's kind of like um NHT or HAJ having like a complex of houses that they're trying to sell. And then probably the realtor is like the sub agents trying to get the house sold. Am I, am I onto something? Am I far um, off? Well, that analogy kind of flawed simply because, okay, for number one, NHC, they don't typically use they, agents. They don't really use agents. agents. Right. Right. But in any event, you are correct in saying that the agent is the sub agent. Or, or um, let me rephrase the question. Let me rephrase the question. Is it like if a developer, because with Silverbrook Apartments, I know the developer um, was trying to get the houses sold. And then if they work with like a realtor to help them sell the house? Yeah. I'm, okay. trying to, I'm trying to have the listeners kind of understand, like in simpler terms, what the broker does. The broker? is the one he's like it <laughs> <laughs> okay so so for example you're working in a bank right the bank which is the entity right but the and loan officer the loan officer is the agent oh. correct and so while we're doing the work on behalf of the brokerage the proceeds are technically that of the brokerages mm -hmm. and then we would get our commission from whatever is paid to the broker you understand Okay. All right, cool. So, I mean, my, my fears about becoming a realtor is this. If it is that I get my license, you know, fresh on the block, new realtor, 
do you face any difficulties in terms of building a network, in terms of building rapport, um, mm -hmm. building clients? And in, in 2021, where, where social media, it's such a critical part of your professional journey. It's bad enough having like a personal page where you've been on Instagram for like three years and you have like 5,000 followers. But then I create this new page and say, hey, guys, go follow my my um, professional page or whatever is that did you face any difficulties with that because i i feel like with every industry it's kind of like a shark eating industry like they don't like the newbies is I'm it really the same with real estate okay so to answer your question yes i know your sphere of influence meaning your family and friends they're going to be critical to your first set of sales. It, they help you to gain traction because your mom is going to go and she's going to be like, my daughter in real estate, you know, so any look at, you understand? <laughs> and that's <laughs> happened a lot. As a matter of fact, the first sale that, um, as I said to you, was in the pipeline or is in the pipeline, it's my best friend. Like, um, one of my best friends, right? So she put me on to somebody. She introduced me to someone and that, that just made a world of difference because you kind of feel a certain kind of way because you put it in all the work you make in the Instagram, you're putting out the content and at the same time, you're not really gaining traction, especially in 2021, where you're inside the networking opportunities are a lot less, right? Because I mean, how it works is for me, I go out and I'm like, I have my phone right here and I keep business cards in my phone. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> right. And I'll be like, Here's a business card. I'm a realtor. If you ever need anything, let me know. You understand? And it's kind of hard when you can't go outside to do these things. <laughs> you know what, as well? Um, a couple episodes back, me and my good brother, Demetrius, we were talking about um, Jamaica overall not being accepting of like diversifying professionals. So for example, me being Dr. Miami, but then I'm also on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok. Everybody knows Dr. Miami. And a lot of persons aren't accepting of professionals doing other things on social media. But I brought that up to say is um, I feel like it's kind of a necessity these days because nowadays a person can't just get their real estate license and that's it. I feel like you have to learn as well to become a content creator because so many persons are on social media. It's almost a, re a requirement to be on social media as well. And I don't mean some boring Android pictures. Yes, I'm an Apple user. <laughs> <laughs> the nope. boring Android pictures. I mean TikToks. I'm talking mini vlogs. I'm talking snippets with a little music in it. I'm talking house tours, possibly a YouTube channel. And I feel like professionals now have to work like five times harder than back in the day. Back in the day, you could just put an ad in a freaking newspaper mm -hmm. and, and that's it. But like now, you gotta be a realtor, you gotta be a video editor, um, a content creator everything a photographer it's just a lot you hit the nail right on the head so and the worst part about it is remember how we talked about all those fees that you have to pay 20 yes. RAG. okay great on i don't even that, count marketing <laughs> that is my point so i'm having to get an upgraded camera i having to get like okay gotta get I, that iPhone <laughs> for morning <laughs> when I do nothing else but a lens to attach to the, the phone so that if you're doing a quick showing you can just basically use it and pan around the room like a house so, tour right I mean if you have an 11 pro well you know that's kind of easier for you because it has a wide angle lens you don't necessarily need a lens um ring lights extremely important okay. yeah so it just start, and I I'm trying to get a drone because you know <laughs> Yeah. No, don't don't count out the outfits as well because you gotta look good in these videos too. <laughs> yes. And so you can see where you can put in a lot of investment and the returns they don't necessarily you don't see them in the short term. You My understand? advice. Yeah. My advice, just work with the free methods right now. Like for me, I've really been trying to be consistent on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy because I'll put up a video and I'll get like 6K views. And I'm like, where was this energy on Instagram? <laughs> Work with the free options that you have because, and I mean, you have an iPhone. So actually you're saving a lot. For me personally, I'm saving a lot of money on equipment because I don't have to buy a professional camera. I don't have to buy 
um, like a, a separate microphone. I don't have anything against Android, please, listeners, if you're listening to this, but I just feel like as a as a person who has experienced Android and Apple, that $800 that I spent three years ago was probably one of the best investments I have ever made. If you follow me on social media, every flyer, every YouTube video is all done from my phone. Believe. <laughs> Him, girl. <laughs> Absolutely same. Yeah, I mean, it's an investment that you have to take. A lot of people bash Apple prices, but you can literally use your iPhone to do anything you want. Now, we're going to get into the spicy segment of this podcast. And that, my friend, is the numbers. <laughs> my listeners love hearing numbers. They love knowing, like, how much money are you going to make, <laughs> you know? Because, I mean, it's hard out here. People want to earn cash, you know what I mean? So here on the Black Standard podcast, as you can see, our name is The Black Standard. And so we aim to, you know, normalize Black wealth, expose areas in which people of color are thriving like yourself, Miss Ford. And I genuinely want to know and, and show our young people, like, you don't have to necessarily become teacher, lawyer, doctor. You guys know the Jamaican culture to thrive, right? Yeah. So as someone who's recently entered the industry, I don't expect you to, you know, have earned a lot of commission so far, but what is your knowledge on like the potential income of a realtor? Um, here's where you talk about the commissions, the percentages on different properties, stuff like that. All right. So to begin, it's hard to answer this question. In real estate, you're getting what you put out. So... For example, you can be earning rental commission as well as sales commissions. Rental commission is what they call quick income, right? So basically, it's a shorter turnover time because what you would get is one month's um, rent as your commission, right? So, yes. So, for really? example, absolutely. So, I'm just going to, you know, use an example of where I'm aspiring to be. I rent. <laughs> I rent a place that's for 5,000 US, right? And they exist. <laughs> and that 5,000 US, of course, it depends because as I explained earlier, it goes to your broker. And if it's a um, co-broking situation, then you won't get all of that 5,000 US. You would get 50% um, of that. It depends. So it depends on- I've heard 70, 30. I've heard 50, 50. I think it depends on the broker. It depends on the broker, which was going to be my next point. So, for example, at Gorizon, our split is 70-30. I know other places, it's that's a, it's a lot. Seven, and 70% is to the agent. You understand? So, but Oh, oh, I feel better yeah. now. Okay. 70% <laughs> is to the agent because we kind of have a more laser fairy type. You're your own boss at Gorizon, right? technically speaking but you understand what i'm saying you really get to do a lot of the work yourself and as i said to you what you put in is what you get out you understand um so yeah where rent is concerned it's a shorter turnover time once a one month's rent is provided then that is paid over to the broker let me correct that one month's rent plus gct because all transactions are tried gct right right um for sales now, it might take a longer time and it depends on if it's a cash sale. It also depends on if it's a new build, right? So that can go 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, right? But you would be getting where a house is concerned, 5%, or if it's a new development, 3%. That is the commission. Wait, what was the first percent? Five. Five. Or the minimum is one. First of all, nobody taking. No, one. I'm. This is what I've been hearing. I when I do the house stores, I I usually you know ask and nudge around like, so how much would you get rid of that? And I was told that the minimum you can get on a property is one percent. I didn't know you could get five percent. <laughs> no, five is industry standard. That is what mo most agents would expect to gain from a transaction. Five percent oh. where. A house is concerned and three percent where a new development is concerned why oh. you might have heard that agent say that is because when she would have probably she or she would have probably calculated the split 
And so what you would be getting is 1.5 if it's a new development. The split right? between the seller's agent and herself yes. or vice versa? Right. Or I was going to ask about that. Or 2.5% if it's a home. So for example, mm -hmm. you are the buyer's agent, meaning you're the one trying to find a home for the buyer. And I'm the seller's agent, meaning I'm the one that's trying to get the home sold. And we come together, you give the person buying and I, prov I provide the property, the split would be 2.5. However, that doesn't mean it's in 2.5 because it goes to the broker and then you would get 7% of that 2.5. I don't know if I like that. <laughs> no, and okay. I don't know if I like that very much. <laughs> Let me break it down into numerical terms so that you can, it's better illustrated that way. I, right? I, I, I've already, I've seen a video like this on YouTube, so I understand what you're talking about, but then it makes you wonder how much are you actually left with? Right. Let's do so the calculation. I, let's do it real quickly. What, what value house are we doing? So let's just do $35 million. Right? Okay. All right, girl, let's go. All right, cool. 5% of, 30, you said 35? Yes, so 5%. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that I got one point seven five. Great. Mm -hmm. That's five percent of thirty-five million. Cool. Now let's say that splits two ways. Yes. Brokers. Um. Oh God. Selling broker. <laughs> and listing broker. That's eight. So we're at eight hundred and seventy-five thousand. Correct. No, I would be getting seven. We, you as a realtor, would be getting seventy percent of this eight seventy-five. Okay, let's do seventy percent. Not bad. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> so, guys, I'm at $612,500 for those of you who probably were calculating. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, at one point, do taxes come in? Is it that a realtor? Um, I don't know if you're going to mention this, but is it that your broker? does your taxes for you as a regular employee employer setting or is it like an entrepreneurship setting like myself where I have to file every year? Yeah, so realtors are considered to be independent contractors. We're not employees, which means that along with not getting the benefits of an employee, we also have to file taxes on behalf of ourselves. In addition, just to clarify, GCT is not taken out of the commission. Rather, it is paid by the purchaser. So... Each mm -hmm. transaction incurs GCT as well as the cost of the home. You understand? So, yeah. Five so, uh, usually lawyers are involved in this transaction. Who pays the lawyer? Is it the client that pays the lawyer or it's you guys? No, no, no. We definitely not. The <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if we're doing... It's that, like no sis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, if we're doing a sales transaction, right? Mm -hmm. the, both would both sides would have the attorney's fee, fees to be paid. However, mm -hmm. let me. I'm going to get a. I've, I've also heard as well that the. Ooh, I don't want to get it wrong. I've also heard that the buyer, like the client, the buyer sometimes has to pay the seller's lawyer fees if right. I don't. Yeah. So that's what I, I, was, I was getting the breakdown for you just so that I could give you exactly, right? So you, the buyer and seller split the cost of preparing the sale agreement. Do you understand? Which is okay. not the attorney's fees, but is to prepare the sale agreement. So you, each party would pay their attorney's fees. Understand? They would also pay to prepare the sale agreement and that is split between um, both parties, buyer and seller. They're also paying transfer tax and that is only paid by the seller. Understand? Um, registration fees is also split. Very mm -hmm. into title, okay? Bank processing fees. So you can see that there are a lot of fees in doing real estate I was gonna say that. <laughs> that is too many. Then, you have closing costs. You also have- um, Land survey fees, did you mention that? No. The and that is typically paid by the purchaser to do a land survey and valuation, especially for the purposes of a mortgage because mm -hmm. the bank has that information in order. The bank to wants to know, yeah. And then the agent's fees. Okay. Right. So we we covered commission. 
Um, I'm glad you really explained how the rental income works because I've always been curious how does the commission work in a, in a situation like that. We've covered the general commission. We've covered the split. I hope you guys are taking notes if you're listening to this. We covered the split of costs between two agents. Um, are we missing anything? I don't think so. I, I don't think so either. I mean, if we do, we can always do another podcast episode. So, you know, let's let's fast forward a little bit. I'm sure that, you know, a lot of professionals, a lot of young people listening to this are interested in knowing, like, you know, what what's going on? How can I get this done? Um, they've either seen my house tours and asked about it or they've seen other real estate content and asked about it. And I think the real estate industry more and more is getting more recognition from a professional standpoint and not just from clients who want to buy or sell. So in your opinion, are you saying that this is a sustainable career field? Absolutely. Because, okay, here's why real estate is so amazing. You don't have to retire if you don't want to ever. Because, I mean, you could show, what, I mean, in addition to pension, right? Make sure you're, you're doing the things that you need to do. You're paying insurance. You're paying mm-hmm. your right <laughs> Doing right. the doing things. Right. You could literally be earning income and not putting in the effort of a nine to five when the time comes. So it it's sustainable for the rest of your life. And you could be making some serious money from doing and, it. And you know what? <clears throat> what I mentioned about social media as well, if you can master that, Absolutely. you'll literally be the first thing that comes to mind when somebody thinks about real estate. Like, if you think about surgery, I'm sure Dr. Mimi comes to mind. And when you build a brand like that, no, I, I've, I will always use Dr. Miami because he perfected what it means to be a social media professional and to use that to pull clients to his business. You know what I mean? And I think once you've mastered that, like you said, you at, at, at some point it goes on like autopilot. So you don't even have to be like, doing a lot of work as a nine to five, like you mentioned, you know, um, where COVID is concerned though, where the pandemic is concerned, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that prices actually went up. And I'm kind of shocked about that because there are two things. I don't expect a lot of people to be buying homes right now because of pay cuts and people losing their jobs and stuff. And I, ironically, yes, the persons that are buying homes are not necessarily the ones suffering from pay cuts. Understand? No, no, is it true? But, you know, I would feel like they're buying because, you know, they say buy when low, sell when high. So I would think that they're buying these homes because they are cheaper. That's why I said I'm confused because <clears throat> here's, here's my understanding. Mm-hmm. Persons can't afford their homes anymore. So they're selling fine. But when you're going to say that persons are buying homes and these aren't necessarily persons who are getting the pay cuts, I also agree. But it's kind of a notion with investing that people buy when the market is low. So how come you're saying that the market is high? <laughs> um, okay. So here's the thing about real estate. The change isn't as drastic as it is in other industries where the market is concerned right now. So... What we're seeing is that the change isn't necessarily, the prices aren't dipping. That's for certain, right? This isn't, inventory is high. That's number one, right? We're seeing a lot of developments. And so what that, what that means is that if the developments are happening, then guess what? It's because they're seeing where persons are buying it. They're trying to meet a need that exists, you understand? And they're trying to meet that demand. No, what I can tell you from experience and from browsing the MLS and I go through this thing every single day and do like, you know, just an analysis of what prices were last year to what they are this year is that you won't necessarily see an, a drastic change in the prices. If anything, they've gone up. So for example, we're seeing now where a one bedroom is $30 million. You know, have to tell me, you know, there's a property over Vermont right now. I remember when Vermont was finished developing and they opened at $14 million. And that listing is on the market for $30 million. <laughs> $30 million. So 
are you understanding now that I'm saying that pre-COVID the prices were not as they are now? But you know what, as well, while you were talking, it dawned on me that possibly the prices are going up as a result of supply and demand as well. Because yeah, remember, yeah. remember in economics, when we learned that when resources, when the, 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 the asset or the resource is scarce and there's a lot of buyers, the price is going to go up because persons are going to start bidding. You know what I mean? And, and possibly, even though persons are selling their homes, probably there are more persons looking to buy homes than persons who are selling. So it's probably driving the prices up anyway. Because I, I, my mind is blown that that property, it, it hasn't even been 10 years, $30 million. And I honestly think she's going to get a sale for it. Listen, okay, let me tell you. The Jax Hall, you know, the Jax Hall Manor. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. When they started selling, subject to correction, but I believe it was in the ballpark of $14 million, $15 million there about, right? I was trying to see if I could look it up really quickly, but... You're looking what was the last price one of them sold for? Not, no, but like when it just came on the market. And I'm okay. telling you, that was not 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And hello, now they're $40 million, girl. Are you understanding what I'm saying? <laughs> Right when they were when they just came on the market, they were in the yeah. like they didn't even know what they were doing when they were doing it. Because honestly, if they noticed that this was going to be the result, they would have charged a higher price for it. You understand what I'm saying? So if anything, what COVID has taught us, I presume it's that persons are saying that when we're done with this, I don't know what that means because I don't know when this is gonna go away. <laughs> but what they're saying is that they're going to they're investing now, not because the prices are low but because the prices are better than they're going to be when we're out of covid probably and you know i think even when covid goes away it's going to take up a good decade or so to actually recover economically i don't know your opinion on this so persons are saying when the pandemic leaves even when the pandemic leaves we're still going to be in hot water if you ask me because even where education is concerned you've had kids that haven't been in a classroom setting for almost two years mm -hmm. the and it's not only about just that aspect. It's just the social implications that that has for us. You've had kids who are going in high school. They're two years into high school. And them don't, them don't have them friends. Like, I would cry. I would literally be so... Can I tell you? I went out on so many different levels. I went out for my birthday two weeks ago. And... It was supposed to be just a dinner setting and we we ended up going to Jangas after and I felt so weird being in a crowd and yep. I just sat, my friend was like, you're not dancing, you're not this and I'm like, eh. <laughs> And okay, so here's the thing, right? It's so strange caveat. being around so many persons. Yeah, caveat, Jangas ever pack. So <laughs> that's one thing. <laughs> Andrew, you need to listen to this podcast. Hello, 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 Mr. <laughs> Mother. Because I feel like, you know what? We're going to talk about this after the podcast, guys. <laughs> hold on. I'm going to wrap up the podcast and then we'll talk because this, this is a whole other topic. And you definitely, you definitely have to come back on the podcast. I love your vibe. And we have a lot more to talk about. I'm sure the people have questions. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you guys in the next episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, do not forget to subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up. We'll be posting videos every single Monday at 9 a.m. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.